Let's turn together in our Bibles now to Romans chapter 16. We'll be looking at verses 17 to 20 this morning. After today, Lord willing, we will have just one more sermon to finish out the book of Romans, uh, which is both exciting and hard to believe. And so I'm looking forward to that. But this morning, uh, we're looking at verses 17 to 20 of Romans chapter 16. And studying this passage this week reminded me, or made me think about, um, one of the ways that people can get confused and off track in the way they think about Christianity, what it means to be a Christian, uh, how churches should function. And and this confusion can exist both for Christians and for non-Christians. And so I want us to begin by thinking about how we think about the way Christians and the way churches are supposed to interact with other people and interact with the world. Do you think of Christians and churches fundamentally as open, welcoming, accepting, or do you think of Christians and churches as fundamentally exclusive, maybe harsh, closed off from the world? Which one of those images comes to mind first for you probably depends in large part on the kinds of Christians and the kinds of churches you have interacted with in your life, particularly at the time in your life that was most formative for you. So perhaps if you were uh, involved with a church in your youth that seemed really harsh or really accepting, that that probably became the, the dominant way that you thought about the way church was supposed to be. And the same is probably true for non-Christians as well. They probably, their impression of what churches are or what churches are ought to be was probably formed by their experience, right? The kinds of Christians they've interacted with, whether more accepting and tolerant ones or more exclusive and critical ones. Well, Christianity is, on the one hand, not supposed to be exclusive, right? Because the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, his perfect life, and the grace that we receive from him when we turn from our sin and trust in him, that's offered to everybody. It's open to everybody. Rich, poor, men, women, children, right? People of all kinds of backgrounds, all ethnicities, all languages, all nationalities. It's for everyone. But on the other hand, Christianity is exclusive. It's only for those who will receive that message, who will confess Christ as Lord, who will acknowledge and turn from their sin. It's only for those who believe that Jesus is the only Savior and the only way to be saved is through His death and resurrection. Again, on the one hand, Christianity is not exclusive. Paul just spent more than a chapter in Romans talking about how Christians can disagree among themselves among lots of, about lots of different things. Right, about different observances, whether you treat certain days differently or not, whether you're allowed to eat all kinds of foods or not, whether you can participate in this or not participate in that. Christians can agree to disagree about a lot of things. But on the other hand, it is exclusive. There are certain things you cannot do and still be considered a Christian. There are certain things you cannot do and still be a member of a church in good standing. Paul, for example, pronounces a curse on those who preach a different gospel in Galatians chapter 1. John, the apostle, tells us that those who don't preach the real Jesus, the one who came in the flesh, are false prophets. Paul says not even to eat with someone who claims to be a fellow Christian but is a drunkard or tangled up in sexual immorality. So what happens is we get into trouble when our understanding of what the church is supposed to do and be veers too far to one side or the other. 
If we only think that Christians and the church are supposed to be accepting and welcoming, then we begin to think that there are no boundaries, that, that there are no markers beyond which you cannot pass and still be counted as a Christian. But the Bible says that's not the case. There are boundary markers. There are lines that we have to draw. But on the other hand, there are some Christians and some churches who seem to focus way too much on the boundary markers. And those boundary markers in those scenarios tend to scoot in further and further and further. Or, or they're just defined by the things that that person or that church cares about the most. Not the things that the Bible says are most important. Both of those are misunderstandings of what the church is supposed to do and be. We need to have a full grasp of what the Bible says we are to be uh, accepting about and tolerant of and what things we are not allowed to tolerate and not allowed to accept. What happens is uh, often people take sort of two categories of Bible verses and they, they put them in two columns as it were and then they get rid of the column they don't like and, and they only talk about the column that they do like and, and it, that can work both ways but if we will read the whole Bible and believe that the whole Bible is God's word and pay attention to the whole Bible and heed the whole Bible then that will help us to stay on the right track. So for example, if we had only spent our time in Romans 14 and 15 talking about how we are to not judge one another and not exclude one another over things that are really not important, but we had neglected the passage we're going to look at this morning in Romans chapter 16, we might have a skewed view of how we are to treat others in the church. But in Romans 16, verse 17, Paul reminds us that there are some boundary lines we have to draw. There are some people that we have to exclude and avoid. So let's look at what Paul says about that in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 20. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good, and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, Paul begins here by talking about whom we should avoid. And it's an interesting shift in tone because, as we saw last week, the first half of chapter 16 is all about welcoming and greeting and commending other believers. It's all about fellowship. It's uh, celebrating the, the unity that these brothers and sisters have in Christ, even though they live in uh, different places, even though they're not all part of the same church. Paul is uh, sending greetings to many that he has met, apparently on his travels, who are now in the church at Rome. He's commending Phoebe, who he's sending to Rome on his behalf. There's a lot of emphasis on unity there, but as one person pointed out, he said, after indicating whom they should greet, the apostle now shows them whom to avoid. Who must we avoid? Should we welcome everyone indefinitely, no matter how they treat us, no matter what they do, no matter what they say? No. Paul warns us in verse 17 to be on our guard against certain kinds of people. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out. Watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles. Be on the lookout. It, unfortunately, not everyone who comes to church, not everyone who shows up at a church, not even everyone who wants to be a member of a church, not even everyone who appears to want to serve and lead in a church is someone that 
you need in your church. Because there are those who come into churches with their own agendas, with their own desires, serving themselves, and they bring division, and they cause trouble, and they lead people astray from Christ. And Paul says you cannot sit idly by while that happens. You have to respond. Paul warned the pastors, the elders of the church at Ephesus, that this would happen to them. The last time he met with them in Acts chapter 20, he said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Watch out, he says. Well, e even watch out for those among your own number, you pastors of the church at Ephesus. Watch out for those who will harm the church, who will uh, come in as wolves, those who will try to draw away disciples after themselves. The Apostle John, when he wrote to the church in 1 John, wrote about a division that had occurred in the church that he was writing to. And here's what he says about those who broke off from that church. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. There are some divisions that occur in the church, in other words, that occur not on the basis of, of sound doctrine. In other words, the people who are creating the division, the division, it's not because they've recognized the church has somehow veered off into some false teaching and they're trying to correct it. No, these are people who have their own agendas, sometimes their own doctrines. They, they want people to follow them and they don't really care about the unity of the church. They don't put the doctrines of Scripture uh, in their proper order and place. Right? They don't emphasize the fundamentals as fundamentals. They create problems. They create divisions. They put obstacles in people's way, Paul says, that are contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. What are we to do with people like that? How are we to respond to people like that? Well, Paul says we are to avoid them. Have nothing to do with them. You don't tolerate them. You don't welcome them. You don't allow them to continue to lead people astray. You avoid them. Why? Look at what he says in verse 18. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites. They're not even, they, they profess to be servants of Jesus, they profess to be Christians, but they're not really serving Christ. They're not really following Jesus. What are they following? Their own desires, their own appetites. They're driven by what they want, not by what Christ wants. And here's what they do. It says, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. They know just what to say. They know how to say it. It's very easy, right, for someone who knows how to, how to speak well, how to communicate to people, maybe has a charismatic personality or whatever. It's very easy for them to gain a following, for them to persuade, for them to lead others astray. He says, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Right, so they are deceivers. They are false brothers. They are not real servants of Christ, driven by their own desires. These are the kinds of people that we have to watch out for. Here, here's what Paul said in Titus chapter 3, which we read from earlier. He says, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Now, if you've been around churches long enough, you've probably encountered somebody like this. 
Maybe, as one person said, you know, they, they kind of go from church to church. They cause trouble at one church. When they've caused enough, they finally get run out there, show up at your church. Repeat, 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 right? You have to watch out for people like that. It's a shame that we have to, but it's reality. Have to watch out for those who pretend to be servants of Christ who are really just serving themselves. Now, Paul's not too worried about the church at Rome, right? When he says this, this to them, he doesn't want them to think that he believes that they're all naive and that they're all just, you know, a, a moment away from being led astray into all kinds of you know, heresy or division or whatever. He says to them in verse 19, your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you. I'm not really worried about you. I'm not anxious that you're, you know, about to be led astray. You're, uh, he said at the beginning of the letter in chapter 1, your faith is known all over the world. Here he says your obedience is known to all. Everybody knows this is a good, solid church. He says, I'm, I'm not, it's not that I'm anxious about you. It's not that I'm worried about you. I'm not wringing my hands, but all the same. It's good for me to remind you that these people are out there, may already be in there, and you need to watch out for them. You need to be on your guard against them. Don't make the mistake of being so nice, being so tolerant, being so accepting and welcoming that you welcome someone who is actually going to lead people away from Jesus. That's too tolerant. That's too accepting. That, that's, not, that's not biblical. You have to watch out for these people, be on your guard against them, and avoid them, warn them. Paul said to Titus a couple of times, and if they don't listen, that's, you got to draw the line. So he rejoices over them, their obedience is known to all, but here's what he says next in verse 19, but I want you to be wise as to what is good, and innocent as to what is evil. This is part of how Paul is calling them to be on their guard. Be wise as to what is good, be innocent as to what is evil. It's very similar to what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 10 when he sent them out. He said, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. How do you do that? Be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. How are we, as Paul says, to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil? Well, let's start with what it means to be innocent as to what is evil. That does not mean be ignorant of Satan's schemes, be ignorant of how temptation works. He doesn't want them to be naive about evil. Right? In fact, that's the whole reason why he just explained in verse 17 and 18 how these divisive people work. He wants them to know what to look out for. He wants them to know what to be on their guard against. Elsewhere, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. We don't want to be ignorant, unaware of, of how evil works. We don't want to be ignorant and unaware of how temptation works. That's part of why Genesis 3 describes the way that the serpent deceived Eve. So that we will learn from that pattern of deception how to recognize Satan's attempts to deceive us and to tempt us. So we're not to be ignorant of how evil works, but we are to be innocent of it in the sense that we don't want to get tangled up in it. We don't want to be involved in it. We don't want to know too much about it by experience. One of the ways that Satan can attempt to lure you into evil is to make you think that you can't really know how to resist temptation until you've given in to temptation. To think that you don't really understand, or can't really understand, what you're up against 
until you've let your enemy have at least a little bit of victory over you. Then I'll know how to resist in the future. Then I'll know how to put up a better fight next time. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. You've got all the information you need about how Satan works and about how temptation works in the Bible. And the way you learn how to resist temptation is not by giving into it, but by continuing to resist it. If you want to know all the schemes that Satan can throw against you, just put on the brakes every time he dangles something in front of you. Because then he'll dangle something else. And then he'll dangle something and you just keep saying, no, I'm not going to bite. He'll throw everything at you. You'll learn about all kinds of ways that he might try to tempt you. You'll learn much more about how to resist temptation that way than by giving in to him. He wants you to look at it the other way. Paul says, be innocent as to what is evil. Don't learn about it from the inside, as it were. That's not how to do it. Be innocent as to what is evil, he says. Be wise as to what is good. Goodness you do want to learn about from the inside. Goodness you do want to give yourself to, saturate yourself in, learn, be wise, be discerning, be knowledgeable about everything that is good. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 4.8. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Give yourself, as it were, to these things. Right? We could summarize that by saying, right, think about whatever is good. When he says whatever is true, whatever is... He's just saying what's good. Think about what is good. Hebrews 13, 16 says... Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Give yourself to what is good and to doing what is good. Be wise, in other words, as to what is good. And then he finishes this paragraph in a way that might surprise us. He says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. What does that mean? And why does he say that here? I suspect that part of why he says it here is because those who cause divisions and put obstacles in people's way that are contrary to biblical doctrine, to sound teaching, they're ultimately following in the path of Satan. They're on his side. They're not followers of Christ. There's only one other side to follow. So I think part of what Paul is saying is God is going to take care of these people who are causing problems. But it also has a longer term meaning, right? That the ultimate defeat, the ultimate crushing of Satan is coming and is coming soon because Jesus' coming is soon and at Jesus' return, he will finally and forever banish Satan. This is a promise that goes all the way back to the first chapters of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 after the serpent had lead, uh, led Eve into sin and Adam followed along beside her, behind her. God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, that is the Messiah, the promised one, he shall bruise your head right, or crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. When Jesus came, that work of crushing and conquering Satan began as Jesus cast out demons from people. And then on the cross, the Bible tells us, Jesus accomplished victory over Satan and demons. Colossians 2 talks about how he triumphed over those demonic powers through Jesus' death. But again, the ultimate victory will come when Jesus returns and Satan is cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. But why does it say the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet? I thought he was going to be crushed under Jesus' foot, under the Messiah's heel. 
Well, he will. Jesus will crush Satan under his feet. But we are his body. So we get to be involved in that defeat of Satan as well. God will crush him. But he will be under our feet. So though right now we face opposition, we face deceivers and uh, people who cause divisions creeping into the church, people operating under the same rules as our enemy Satan does. We know that one day we won't have to watch out for people anymore. We won't have to be on our guard anymore. Because in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, there will be nothing accursed. There will be no sin. There will be no more temptation. No more death. None of that. Our enemy will be conquered, and we will dwell with the God of peace. And as we look forward to that day, we say, Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray.